University, Hill of the Nation's Future. Today it not only preserves and transmits knowledge and values, it serves more and more as a center of research and innovation. It has been called the chief energizing and creative force in our entire social system. The modern university is the cradle of the nation's future. But if this be so, let us not underestimate the task we face. Meanwhile, the explosive growth of knowledge still increases the demands upon us. The underdeveloped peoples look to us for training and guidance, and our own governments, the local governments, state governments, national governments, look increasingly to the universities for expert counsel and for scholars whom they can borrow to staff posts of high responsibility. much Kirk's personality and his style of administration may have exacerbated the situation in there no matter who was president of Columbia University. Right. So that, uh, that, you know, Cordier came out with this thing that he's going to recommend that every month or every week uh, each dean set aside some time to talk to students who don't have appointments, which makes the liberal assumption that what we have here is a failure of communication. But that isn't so, because it's an analysis of an entire system, of the functioning of a corporate entity that is at question. The students understand very, very well what the ruling class of Columbia does, what it is about. The university now has become, to use an old term, a means of production, whereby one guy does a little bit for IDA, another a little bit for CIA, where the troops, the NRTC, are trained here. And this university is now a means of production producing the mechanisms of human oppression. It's been bought out by the military. 50% of the research done here at this university depends on defense money. And we can see when we look at the new buildings that are going up, that it's an engineering building, a business school, a law school, a school of international relations. We can tell how much this university is hooked into servicing the corporations and hooked into servicing the war machine. William Burden is a director for Lockheed Aircraft. Maurice Moore is the counsel for General Dynamics, the F-111 company, and a junior partner in his law firm was the undersecretary of defense. Kirk himself is uh, a trustee of the Institute for Defense Analysis. He is president of Morningside Heights Incorporated, the organization which is concerned with institutional expansion on Morningside Heights. Also, if you, if you wonder how it was that Columbia uh, acquired the land for the gymnasium, a uh, 400-year lease, renewable every five after the first 100 years, at an incredibly low sum of money, all you have to do is look at who the trustees are. Percy Uris uh, is chairman of the board of the Uris Buildings Corporation, a corporation which has done 17% of all the building in New York City since the war. Benjamin Buttonweiser, one of the trustees, is on the Uris Building Corporation. Courtney C. Brown, who is also on the Uris Building Corporation, is one of the directors of the board of CBS. William S. Paley, a trustee, uh, is chairman of the board of the Columbia Broadcasting System. Uh, Arthur Hayes Salzberger, he's uh, chairman of the board of the New York Times. For two successive sessions of the state legislature, uh, Columbia's ruling elite uh, made journeys to Albany, New York, to convince legislators that this was indeed a wonderful thing for the Morningside Heights community, that Columbia should uh, build its gym there. But I don't think a gym nine stories high with facilities for black people in the basement with a back door is something that black people want. There has never been any dispute as to the position of this community on the placing of a gymnasium by a private institution in a public park. I don't trust anybody in the administrative network of Columbia University because they have lied, they have contradicted themselves. Grace and Kirk wrote us a letter saying, we have stopped the gym. And the next damn day, the Board of Trustees states, we have stopped the gym temporarily. This house went up on violence and this country's going down on violence. As a house go up, our house must come down. Whether you like it or not. 
On April 23rd, SDS called a demonstration in which we plan to demonstrate inside Lowe Library to protest Columbia's complicity with the Institute for Defense Analysis, its racism in building the gym in Morningside Park, and its attempted suppression of the left by disciplining six students. About 500 people join, joined us at the sundial. We were opposed by about 200 jocks. We found that not only were the jocks there blocking our way, but we found when we got to Lowe Library that the library was locked by the administration. I must have thought that would stop us, but it didn't. Because we went into Harlem, we busted at the gym site. The pigs called in reinforcements. down in the park. The cops were coming pretty quickly. And these numbers were building up. And Mark Wright got up on the dirt mound and asked us to leave because we had 300 people back to Sundial if we would go back and meet them. Taking Hamilton was, and Coleman was just the perfect thing after that. Except it wasn't so perfect because, I don't know, at that, at that point we were really we were moving faster than we uh, knew how. Tremendous snowball, tremendous Yeah, I mean, morale. almost despite ourselves. It was something we really wanted to do. On the other hand, it was something that we weren't sure we were ready to do. It's our responsibility to use coercion. Well, you've used coercion. But we haven't, we we haven't, haven't completed it. Our legal means working is, uh, is this political, uh, political pressure from congressmen and the community working. Is uh, our speeches and uh, peaceful demonstrations working. Is that you're assuming that if you go through whatever channels you're going through, you're going to come out right. Well, we're hoping. Some of these things have gone on for a week before the outcome has come. At that point, we took Dean Coleman, thinking he was our trump card. But we really, we didn't know that our real strength was in holding the buildings and staying there. The real thing about the black-white split was that the two groups realized that we had two different political identities. The blacks wanted to stop the gym. They figured the best way to do this was to hold the building, barricade it. The whites, on the other hand, saw and, and still see that our goal is to radicalize other white people. We didn't want to confront other students coming to class. We thought that our, our, we should confront our enemy, the administration. But we didn't realize we were t that we were much too timid, and that what we really had to do was to show our, our moral strength and hold the building. Now, the blacks saw that we were split amongst ourselves, that we weren't disciplined, and that we really didn't understand what the correct militant tactic was. So they asked us to leave. Well, Mark came down from a steering committee meeting and told us that the blacks had asked us to split. We left and took Low Library, the seat of the administration. Look, it's been two days and we've taken five buildings. Hamilton, Low, Avery, Fairweather, and Mayer. If we've got the administration figured right, they're up to calling the cops. And when they do, we want to be here. We barricaded up the basement, and the police were trying to come through. So what the brothers did was throw some uh, water hoses on them and knock the police back, that kind of thing, you know, and flooded the whole basement. Now, that was one of the best tactics. The police were very angry about that. But then they still didn't charge the building, and, and they were pretending that they didn't even try to come through the tunnels into the basement of the building. But they were trying to, like, take the building by surprise, quietly, that kind of thing, you know, and, and beat the movement that way. You know, try to defeat it before it spread to the black community, because I'm sure they weren't that worried about a handful of black students at Columbia University. It was when those kind of tactics and that kind of militancy you get from the university and the brothers in the community say, look, hey, these brothers up here who got it made are revolting too against the system. That's what they were trying to defeat, but they couldn't get through. <laughs> mothers there uh, who didn't have any sons in Columbia, who didn't want to see that park there, uh, who didn't want IDA to be running down experiments at the school against their children and against their families. Everything from the far right, such as Car U Act, to uh, 
the liberal right, such as Charles Kenyatta, to the far left, such as uh, Epton and PL, and independent of uh, black militants. These black high school kids, man, they snuck, wrap around, and right of the nose of hundreds of TPF. But when we, when we gathered at Brandeis and we were walking up Amsterdam Avenue to Columbia, we were talking about burning the fucking place down. And, you know, we, we came up with baseball bats and hockey sticks. And when we got to Columbia, we broke through the police lines. They took H. Grant Zone in here. They what? They brought H. Grant Zone in here. Here's a statement that was released by the students on the inside. I'll read the statement. Number one. Stopping of the construction of the gym. Hey, Number two, got it. Dropping got it. of the charges against all persons involved in demonstrations against the gym. Hey. Hey. Number three, breaking of all faculty and administrative ties with IDA. Number four, general amnesty for all the students involved. When the university has stopped construction of the gym and granted an amnesty, we will consider the questions of negotiation with the university. We are prepared to remain indefinitely until these conditions are met. The black students of Columbia University, joined by a few members of the black community, have been in Hamilton Hall for 56 hours. More than that now. We have established a cafeteria with adequate stores for all conti continuously. A physician is in charge of our infirmary. Morale is high. who went into Low Library, only 23 stayed when the first cop scare came. But as the days wore on, we realized that our strength was in our militancy in staying in those buildings. It took the example of the blacks to move us. The first thing we did when we got into Kirk's office was hit his files. Besides uh, a bunch of crap in his girly magazines, we found a bunch of papers linking Columbia to the IDA, uh, a whole bunch of shit about putting down SDS, and a lot of letters about cleaning up the area by moving out the blacks and the Puerto Ricans. First day in math, we set up a defense committee which took care of putting up the barricades. We decided what our policy would be toward police, toward jocks. We soaped some of the stairs, we taped the windows, we emptied bookcases and put them up in front of the windows in case tear gas canisters did get through the tape. And it hung up a lot of people when there'd be a little scratch or a mar on one of the marble top desks or something. At the second time we built barricades, these hang ups had disappeared and we had decided that barricades were necessary politically and strategically and anything went in making strong and this time permanent type barricades. Defense is all taken care of. Security is a problem. Letting people in and out of the buildings. Watches. We need people to watch the windows every night. We had a walkie-talkie set up. Citizens band walkie-talkies. Plus, there were telephone communications to every building, which the, the university tapped. We had three mimeographs that worked constantly, and there were people who did nothing during the strike but relate to the mimeograph machine. And there was a big sign on the wall, quote from somebody in Berkeley, which says, uh, five students and a mimeograph machine can uh, do more harm to a university than an army. Uh, every building had their own little communications room that had to deal with the four or five modes of communication that we were, uh, we were using. what happened was that each new group of people who came in the building, each new day's recruitment uh, to the building, would uh, become political, would understand the life of the commune, would understand what was going on uh, by the meeting. The stable of commune life was the meeting that we'd meet for approximately eight hours a day. A lot of it was political education, a lot of it was just bullshit, a lot of it was worrying about what we'd do when the police came. Well, SDS is in, in name representing the student body, but in fact it's a, steer, it's a steering committee of, of various people from campus. And we're now trying to combat a, a, a faculty statement to the effect that, that uh, no amnesty will be granted to students under any circumstances. The question of amnesty is really important because it's a political question. Our legitimacy to protest has to be recognized before we can negotiate. There seems to be a lot more dignity amongst the students now because they, 
they feel that they have a right to say the things they're saying. That's why I think maybe the amnesty issue has been raised and re-raised so many times here, and we've had to reassure ourselves by, by issuing votes of confidence for it every 30 minutes, because people are not sure whether they're supposed to be guilty for what they're involved in. And the whole issue of demanding amnesty first is to show that we have rights, and until we get those rights, we have to act in a coercive way. The hang-ups that are usually present in any kind of collective enterprise were absolutely not there. All year at school, I complained about my one roommate in the dormitory, but then I got to the library, we had 100 people in three rooms, and there was a space, sleeping space of three feet for two people. And the, thing, the idea of privacy and the idea of sleeping sort of became so insignificant. We never really got too much sleep, because we were always having meetings and things, and people were always yelling and waking us up. But we, we didn't really care so much. We slept on the floor wherever we could, and, and that was about it. And what the life of the commune was, was a group of people who were incredibly close to each other, on no other level than the level of struggle. The strikers were getting community support. They were getting blankets, food, and money. But they were also getting some opposition from the faculty and from right-wing students. The jocks messed around low. They had locked arms, and every now and then they would, they would try and keep the food out. They tried to keep a record player out, radios, everything. They were acting as the stooges for the administration. These people have construction. They're going to stand here, arms crossed. They're not going to say anything. That's our only position. How about food? No comment on food at the moment. Motherfuckers have been eaten. They haven't. Of course they have. They got plenty of. They don't have any. They don't have any left. They called us up. You haven't been up there. Don't say anything. They don't have any food. These cats have been eaten. Hey, you're getting blood. That's all they wanted. You're getting it. You don't need. You don't need to have it. position of the professors was one of being the police, that they had to take sides. Either they were for taking food in or not for taking food in. They were on the side of the jocks or on our side. But they never understood that. The faculty wanted to mediate between us and the administration because they never understood the nature of our demands or of our struggle. Kirk certainly understood what was going on much better than the faculty did. The faculty was in its own way just as naive as the law and order politicians were, because the only alternative they could see to the maintenance of the present system was chaos. They couldn't see beyond the occupation of the buildings to the creation of something that might be better. Everyone was, for, for like an, at least an entire week, living at full capacity. There was a total collective feeling. No one particularly cared about his individual feelings because he never even experienced them. Everything was experienced in the most collective sense that I've, I've ever known. If you talk to anyone outside, they immediately realized that, that there was something there that they, they had never seen before. That this was one of the um, new experiences for most of the people at the strike. It's sort of an electric awakening. It was communal food. We ate what was given to us, what we could find, but mostly, what was most important is we shared everything. We shared our oranges, our cokes, our sandwiches, and surprising to all of us was, was this urge that we didn't want to eat something all by ourselves. If somebody beside us was, was hungry, we didn't have a sandwich, we'd share our sandwich. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
when the fair weather was so high tonight, we decided that it would be entirely appropriate to be married. <laughs> It was felt that fair weather was not only holy ground, but was our home. And we therefore chose to be married at home with our family. I, Andrea, take thee, Richard. I, Andrea, take thee, Richard. I, Richard, take the Andrea. I, Richard, take the Andrea. I now pronounce that Andrea and Richard are children of the new age. in connection with our complaint against you. This order to remove yourself forthwith is separate and apart from any question of amnesty. You will be subject to proper disciplinary action by the university in any event. Of course, those who leave the building pursuant to this order will have less to answer for than those who do not. And they managed to kind of push them all together, and they were all sitting on the floor. As they pushed them all together and got them so they could hardly move, they would hit, um, they had something in their hands. I was just there, these people, they don't say they line up and they rush. You think that's what I, you can't run fast enough. This is nothing. Show you. Watch it, watch it. Okay, get back. Bring them into the door. Bring them into the door. Hey, you got doctors in the door. Bring them into the door. There's a doctor in the door. Peter, there's a doctor in the door. There's a doctor in the door back. These, these guys are animals. They're animals. They don't wear uniforms. They, 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 hack. they, 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 they think they're fucking one in the neck. Along the staircase, there was a solid line of police. The people in front of me were dragged down, and as they were dragged down, each individual cop standing on this line put his licks in, and they were laughing. I'll never forget it. There seem to have been orders given to this because I saw it so often during the demonstration. <laughs> well, I, I dropped my glasses when I was running. I asked a cop officer, could I please go back? And he whacked me in the fucking face. <laughs> Wait, not so fast. I was hit with a club on the head. I was punched in the nose. I found a, a student who was dazed, bleeding profusely from the forehead. The police refused to let me pass. I said, this man is wounded. He needs help. They said, get out. Police had formed two lines which you had to run through, being pummeled all the time. He, he was very fortunate in that he wasn't kicked in the groin as most of the demonstrators were. Instead, he, was, he just had his legs kicked and his back punched. However, at the end of the line, he was hit with a blackjack, at which point he was unconscious. The next thing that he remembers was that he was uh, in the first aid station. Not 
nothing against the cops. We have it against Kirk. We realize the problem. Get pictures and get the reporters. We have a specific issue. The faculty stood with us, the students stood outside, and the strikers stood there. We will admit we are guilty. We wish to be charged. I want this all down. We will give names. We will give anything. Is there no sanity? Where was Auschwitz? Is there no thinking here? Will people not realize this insanity? Cops do not belong on campus. I am guilty. I wish to be arrested. Two fans have already pulled away. Now they're moving in another one. And I'm not going to read this many I like to know what I'm they got over 700 of us on charges of criminal trespass, resisting arrest, all kinds of other shit, some of which was real and some of which was completely fake. I know of nurses and doctors that pleaded with the police not to, uh, not to proceed, to please let these men alone. And they would say, no, no, that's, that's get away, this is our job. I was uh, arrested, uh, they would not allow me to see a doctor. I had broken ribs, my face was cut, I got hit with a pistol under the eye and uh, I was bleeding there, and I wasn't allowed to see a doctor until I got out of court, which was approximately an hours later. But I was awarded a fellowship for next year. What the hell does... I'm sorry. Uh, what does it mean? I, 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 I'm going to strike. But I hope every fact... I don't, I don't see how any teacher, I don't see how any student can attend this school anymore. And I was completely liberal about the whole thing. But this bus has radicalized everybody, and me very personally. No, I was a, I was a non-violent student. I was completely passive. I didn't care what happened. I was completely neutral. I'm not neutral any longer. Is there I'll occupy buildings tomorrow. According to six written affidavits compiled by a professor of mathematics, Serge Lang, much looting and destruction occurred inside mathematics between 7 a.m. and 2 p.m. During these hours, the only people permitted inside the building were policemen, members of the press, and a very small group of building staff. When I got out of jail and got back to math, I looked around for my camera and my light meter that I left behind. All I found was a lot of exposed film, broken lenses. Who, who the fuck else would have done it but the cops? It's, it's interesting to note that Arthur Hayes Salzberger, one of the trustees, just happens to be the chairman of the board of the New York Times. And one wonders why certain things were distorted in the Times coverage of the strike. Other things that appeared in the evening edition changed in the morning edition. And I think the answer is clear enough. I mean, take a look. What is this? A goddamn police state? They got cops all over the campus. Uh, that comes every entrance. The gates are locked. You got to show two cards to get in. What is this? France? Double delification, please. Double delification, please. I didn't know. Double delification, please. Okay. Get ahead. Finals. Study. Get ahead. Work, prosper, get ahead. Grades, final, get ahead. Study, get ahead. Jobs, get ahead. Get ahead, get ahead. Papers. Police, ah, ah, forward, forward, march.
in decisions that affect our lives. We call on all students, faculty, staff, and workers of the university to support our strike. We ask that all students and faculty not meet or have classes inside buildings. We have taken the power away from an irresponsible and illegitimate administration. We have taken power away from a board of self-perpetuating businessmen who call themselves trustees of this university. We are demanding an end to the construction of the gymnasium. The gymnasium being built against the will of the people of the community of Harlem. A decision that was made unilaterally by powers of the university without consultation of people who, whose lives it affects. We are no longer asking, but demanding an end to all affiliation and ties with the Institute for Defense Analysis, a defense department venture that collaborates the university into studies of kill and overkill that has resulted in the slaughter and maiming of thousands of Vietnamese and Americans. We are no longer asking, we are demanding that students and faculty have a say in the policies of the university. We find our lives being governed by men who do not understand the problems of the day. It has become increasingly clear that they don't even understand the elements and the ingredients of the creative discord that begins to show up in the West today. What they are able to do, if given their reign, is to create a world order which in every one of its aspects depends absolutely on the power of the police to maintain it. They have no other power. When you have understood when you have understood the uniform and the badge and the coercive violence of the billy club, napalm, and atomic bomb, then you have understood absolutely the sole legacy of those like Jason Kirk who pretend to authority in our world. It is this generation coming to its maturity behind, and I suspect one day beyond, the tumbled barricades in New York and in Oakland and in Florence and Rome and in Paris and in London, which is about to shape the future.
and will continue to be run without the auspices and the power of the administration. Well, any classes have been set up at this university. The purpose of the new classes is to establish a free, open, democratic, and meaningful discourse between faculty and students. We have put an end to the old system and structure of Columbia University. Classes are being held on lawns, on campus, in Ferris Booth Hall, and in apartments of faculty outside of campus. Students were saying three major things. First, they were saying that they were class. Second, they were saying to the faculty that they could no longer accept the paternalistic role that teachers traditionally play in the university. Learning takes place in dialogue and between equal men. They said, in effect, we will no longer let you play some kind of big daddy to us. Third, they were saying that the demands and actions had to be taken seriously, could not be dismissed with some kind of bullshit platitudes about youth and idealism, because they were involved in political action on the highest level of human seriousness. Tonight, there is a new liberated area in this neighborhood. We're going to support those 50 community members that have taken over the building. Presently in the building, there are 40 to 50 representatives of community groups, of political clubs, of organizations involved in the Morningside Renewal Council, organizations that have been fighting Columbia's expansion policies for years. This is not a student occupancy. Students right now are the vanguard, but it's the masses of people in the area in New York around Columbia that's finally going to stop Columbia. Well, it seems, I mean, sometimes there seems to be a kind of contradiction between support action and fighting your own particular kind of oppression, which is what we're always talking about. But in fact, what we came to see during the strike was uh, that... When you want to oppose uh, an institution of that sort, you have to do you've, it got, on to all fronts, you've right. got to fight on all fronts. Right. Columbia has closed our streets, gobbled up our parkland, seized over 100 of our buildings, and forced the removal of over 8,000 people from their homes. Why is the Community Action Committee predominantly white? Of the 8,000 tenants of small hotels, SROs, and old law tenements whom Columbia has systematically displaced, only a specially selected token number of minority group families now reside in Morningside Heights. We've deplored this deliberate creation of a white ghetto. Hey, hey. I don't want to be arrested. You're free to leave. I don't want to be arrested. You want to be arrested. Either go to the wagon or walk to Riverside Drive if you don't want to be arrested. Riverside Drive with a wagon. Riverside Drive with a wagon. We want to have a decent life. In order to show the solidarity of people with six strike leaders who they tried to suspend, they decided to take Hamilton once again. After three votes, the majority decided to stay. Most militant people had left Hamilton because they didn't want to get busted a second time. But those were the people who formed the core of the stuff that was going around outside, building barricades and fighting the cops. They're moving. Why? 
line of detectives into the crowd. The crowd surrounded by the police. because the cops could break them down. So they engaged in combat with them. They threw lamps at them. They charged them with bricks. They built the barricades. Amsterdam Avenue and 116th Street. For the first time in the history of Columbia University, there will be two graduations in Morningside Heights. The one we're looking at now is the official ceremony, acknowledged by the trustees and attended by the faculty and administration. At a given signal from the students, almost the entire graduating class is expected to leave this ceremony and protest over its legitimacy, and to hold their own graduation as a repudiation of the trustees. They expect to be joined by a few members of the faculty.